Mike McCool here with the Royal Examiner in the studio with me today is Jeff Ryan, an author about the Appalachian Trail and a lot of other things here according we were just talking before we rolled the tape. So uh, Jeff, uh, good to have you here. Glad Thank to see you you're back me. in Front Royal. You yeah. were here I guess about a year ago at the right. library so right. we're glad of that and you'll be going over to the Royal Bookshop. Yes. I always call it a bookstore and Tammy said no no it's a bookshop. Right <laughs> it is. It's very much a shop. <laughs> So, so I'll what, be there tomorrow from uh, 1 to 5. All right, 1 to 5. It's a very interesting place, and, and uh, there's a following oh, yes. uh, at, at the bookshop. That's great. So let's talk about your newest book here. Sure. It's called Blazing Ahead. Right there, Mark. Get a good picture of that, that book cover right there. You got it? All right. We want to plug the book. You know oh, how they sure. say it. While you're here, let's plug the book, right? right? And, come, and come tomorrow, <laughs> and I'll sign one for you. There you go. There you go. So this one here is your newest one. Yep. The one you wrote before. The Appalachian Odyssey. Right. This is your, what well, you're talking about. My you debut spent, book, right. Yeah, you spent 28 years on the trail, and uh, this is your story. It's right. It's heavy. It's heavy. It's got a lot of color pictures. <laughs> oh, I in see it. that. Yeah. It's really neat. All right. Yeah. So so let's talk about your newest one first, then okay. we'll go backwards. How's All right. It? That sounds good because chronologically it actually makes more sense. <laughs> okay, there way. you go. <laughs> um, what happened was I, I was writing my first book, and I really got intrigued by. Who were these people that designed and built the trail? And um, as most people know, when they're hiking along, um, trails don't just happen. Someone's right. got to come up with the idea, and someone needs to execute building it. So it goes all the way back to 1921 when um, this fellow, Benton Mackay, came up with the idea for the trail. Um, he was thinking in grandiose terms. At that time, there was really only one long trail, it was literally called the long trail, that went the length of Vermont, but nobody had thought of a trail going 14 states. It was originally proposed by Mackay to be 12 states, and it really caught on, uh, particularly in the nascent hiking community. There were some pockets of avid hikers even back then in the 20s, uh, mostly in New England. Appalachian Mountain Club was strong. They were 40 years into existence at that point. So he took the idea and extended it. And then it just kind of hit a wall. After about five years, there wasn't really anything getting done. And this young buck from Maine, a 29-year-old guy, naval officer named Myron Avery, took control of the project and how. And he built almost single-handedly a 2,000-mile trail by himself in nine years. Wow. He wow. went out, he was the first 2,000 mile hiker. He sighted every step of the trail, almost. Uh, there was some parts of Pennsylvania that he didn't preside over, but most of the trail, essentially all of it. Um, he wrote the guidebooks. He, he was fastidious about measuring the trail. He had a bike wheel that he rolled in front of him and it went down to the tenth of a mile. Wow. Wow. And every corner that he turned on the trail or took a stream crossing or whatever, he was taking notes. And the, the joke is you can't, you can hardly find a picture of the guy without this bike wheel or a notebook. <laughs> well, um, yeah. You know, he was, he was figuring, while I'm designing this thing, I might as well be writing the guide at the same time. That's right, that's right. Well, because I, you know, here in Front Royal, we call it mile zero. Right. Know? But... Uh, there's a lot of people that come on and off the trail here. It's a very convenient for them to do it. The, the community supports the hikers. They sure. come here and and uh, we you know we even put our trolley out there to help draw them into town to right. give them a little lift. You know, right. so uh, we do. We're very familiar with it with it here. So well, it's interesting you say that because the thing that Mackay was really spot on with was the economic benefit of having the trail. Even when he wrote the original article proposing the trail. He was, he was espousing the um, economic benefits right. for people that owned uh, lodging, restaurants. Um, you know, now it's sort of gone into laundromats and exactly. gear suppliers. That's and right. We have uh, at least two uh, companies here in town that really 
kind of like are geared around the trail. Right. And uh, in the summertime or in the weather's warmer, you know, you'll see the backpacks in front of LD's Pancake House on, on the, exactly. on the, in the mornings and, and uh, you can tell. Sometimes you can smell the hikers, you know, but most of the time they're not too bad. <laughs> right. Well, it's funny. I've, I'm often asked about how the easements and all of that piece of building right. the trail. Right. I was just going to say, did he worry about easements when he built this thing together? Or? Well, uh, part of it went over. You couldn't do this today. I don't think we could ever build this today. Not the way they did it. Well, part of it you could because of the national park and state right. park land. Right. That that part of it was relatively easy to to get. The interesting part was what Avery did in Maine because Maine was not originally slated to be part of the trail. It was supposed to end at Mount Washington in New Hampshire. Right. And it was Avery that pushed north into Maine 288 more miles. Wow. And he also pushed it beyond Mount Mitchell down south to go down to um, Georgia. But what was really interesting about this whole thing is a lot of it was built during the Depression. And so to get the easements in Maine, what Avery did, he grew up in Maine, so he kind of knew the lay of the land. Right. He went to the owners of the hunting and fishing camps that were running guiding uh, services in the spring and fall, but the summer is notoriously dead spot for exactly. that. Exactly. There's no fishing, there's no hunting. So he went to them and said, what would happen if people came down off a hiking trail that crossed your land and paid money to eat and spend the night? And he got nearly 100% buy-in particularly because it was during the Depression. Well, sure, sure. So, you know, boom, the thing got built. Um, so that was that was really an amazing insight on his part. Well, it's very Smart interesting. It's very interesting. Let's talk about your debut book sure. just for a minute here. Yeah. Because I've seen that at the bookshop. So yeah. was, tell us about that one. Well, Appalachian Odyssey is the 28-year hike on America's Trail. And my buddy Wayne Sear and I actually started hiking the Appalachian Trail inadvertently. Uh, we went on a day hike up Katahdin in Maine at the northern end, which is four and a half miles one way. And so we did a day hike. And I took he and some friends of his from work, and we just went up to the top and came back down. And we had no idea. That was 1985. Never would have. Never, never <laughs> knew that it was the beginning of a 28-year hike. Or a book. No, it, it, absolutely not. And then we started doing the long trail over in Vermont. He lived in uh, Connecticut, so he'd come up from Connecticut. I'd drive over from Maine, and we'd meet on some mysterious logging road somewhere, spot one car, drive somewhere else, and hike back to the other vehicle. And it was probably three years into that where one night in the tent he was looking at the guidebook over dinner, and he said, you do realize that we've started the Appalachian Trail. And I, I'll never forget it because I said to him, you got to be kidding, man. It will take us 30 years. And he and said, he said did, so it? what? And I went, wow, that's really amazing. Yeah, so what indeed. So that's what we did. Um, we smorgasbordered it. So every year it was, where do you want to go next year? Let's do part of Pennsylvania. Let's do part of Virginia. A lot of let's do part of Virginia because right. it's a quarter of the trail. Right. right. Um, the diagonal sweep yes. is 500 plus. It's a long drive. It's a long <laughs> haul. And um, it's a long walk. And um, I, I can imagine that too. And so he's an analyst by trade, so he picked that out early on. And so we should start picking away at Virginia segments. Get or the long you know, part over with yeah. first, yeah. So we did that, and we jumped around, and, and you see it in the book. And then... Probably about five years left to go, we started joking when we were out hiking that, okay, this belongs in the, in the book. And um, it really kind of took, took form that way. And fortunately, I'm, I'm a writer anyway, so every night in the tent I took journal notes of what the big highlights of the day were, and I took a ton of pictures, as you can see. Right, right. There are about 90, 90 or 100 pictures there in color. And then the other thing I did was I put in profile maps of the whole trail so that you can, as you're reading along, really get a sense of follow along. Of, of the, the contours because I, I think for any of us that have read any uh, adventure stories, when someone says we went up a ridge, right. what does that mean? Right, right. Is it 20 feet or is it 1,000? And so I, I wanted to give people an idea of not only what the topography was like, but the decision-making into where we camped. 
so I have a little icon where we tent it. And a lot of it has to do with where the water is. Right. Um, so, and, and you don't want to ideally start with a huge grunt in the morning, so <laughs> we try to go up a little bit and camp up high right. so that we don't have to start with a thousand foot climb or whatnot. Right. But, right. So we just kept going, and then 28 years into it, we turned so the corner and So you finished, finished the it, entire? Finished the whole thing. Well, that's great. So you can do it again? I'm, we actually uh, kept going, not on the AT, but we literally just finished last week um, the New England Trail, which goes from uh, Long Island Sound to Mount Monadnock in New Hampshire. It's about 315 miles. All right. That's the shortest of the 11 National Scenic Trails. That sounds like another book. Yeah, it might be. <laughs> well, you said you had a book at the printer. I do. So let's talk about that just for a second. So yeah. we can entice people to come back next year. <laughs> sure. This one, um, it, when I was researching these two books, I found I, it just complete happens. Everything seems to happen for a reason. But I was in my office one night, and the, the fellow came in to do the, the weekly cleaning of the office. And he asked me one time, how come you're always in here so late? And I said, I'm working on a book. And it's nice and quiet in here. Right. So, anyway, his vacuum cleaner notwithstanding. <laughs> and um, he said, Oh, the Appalachian Trail, I have something for you. And he, the next week he showed up and he said, I bought this at a yard sale for five bucks. You can have it. It was a 1934 guidebook written by Myron Avery to the, the trail in Maine as it existed then. Wow. And so I was reading about the history of the trail and it said there was a side trail to a hermit's cabin and the hermit uh, it was actually an officially blazed blue blaze trail off the Appalachian Trail and it said this guy was a colorful character so and that there had been an article about him in the Boston Herald in 1934 so I figured well I'm gonna look this guy up and boy I, I couldn't believe what I found um, the the Reader's Digest version is um, the guy was born in New York City. He ran away from home at age 16. He joined the German Navy. He became a merchant marine. He became the equivalent of a multimillionaire in the 1890s. He went to Maine and decided he had more money than God. I'm going to build a cabin and live in the middle of nowhere. And uh, That's with the no American neighbors. dream, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> so he did. And um, what was really interesting is um, he lost his fortune when World War I started. He had invested all of his money in German shipping, and poof, um, as soon as the war started, it was gone. Right, right. And somehow he made, amassed another fortune before he died in his 60s. He made another run at it, and he, he also topped uh, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars and no one could figure out how he did it. And um, the secret to how he did it is in the book. Oh, so I'm not going to now disclose to see, that. That's the Got ultimate <laughs> teaser. <laughs> so in 1929, so what's the title of this book? it's called Hermit, The Mysterious Life of Jim White, W-H-Y-T-E, -E, right. um, which was not his real name. He changed his name when he got to Maine. His, Protect the his, innocent. Yes, right? his real name was William Bosine. Yeah. Um, but he totally, yeah, he, um, he was not living alone. He had at least three wives. The last one stayed with him for 20 years. And then when he lost his fortune, she disappeared. Um, uh, you know, draw your own conclusions. We yeah. don't know. That hasn't changed <laughs> but, you know, a bit, has it? <laughs> so, um, so she left the scene and, um, she went on to be very happy, um, she went on to other other pursuits than living with a hermit up on a hill in a cabin. So how do so, you go about researching things like this? Because I'm sure that's not uh, something you can just Google his life on the... It isn't. It was very difficult. But fortunately, he lived right outside a town called Monson, which is at the southern end of the last 100 miles of the Appalachian Trail, which is called the 100-mile wilderness. There's literally nothing between Monson... And, and those people mountain. never moved, so you were able to get first-hand knowledge. Well, right? the, the uh, <laughs> historical society was a godsend, and they found a, a ton of stuff, including they dug up a picture of the hermit sitting in the first automobile owned north of Portland, Maine. It was a 1910 Apperson automobile, open right, right. car. Yeah. And he's sitting in it with a friend and a dog, and 
it's one of the few known photographs of this guy and I found that I did some genealogy that I could do and the rest of it just started falling into place. Right. It's coming like a detective novel. It is. You just, you just it, kept digging and it's a mystery. Yeah. Um, it's a it's based on um, fact, but I had to invent some characters. Well, you to, had to, to embellish it, it a little to, bit to, to make move it, it along. Yeah. Well, that's great. Well, it sounds very interesting. Yeah. I heard great things about this book. Yeah. This book here, you. I heard a lot of good things about this one. Yeah. And this one sounds really interesting. Yeah. Uh, this one's more of a historical take on what was happening in the world and the challenges that these two men faced. But not only that, they were completely opposite personalities. Um, Mackay was a sort of a planner, but he didn't have the capacity to put together a team to build out the trail. Right. And that's why Avery came to the rescue. So you sort of need the doer and the dreamer to come together to make sure. anything like that. Well, it's, I'm sure this would be very interesting to people that have been on the trail yes. or are thinking about hiking the trail. It would be very interesting a book to read. I really yeah. appreciate it, Jeff. We'll be at the um, Royal, Royal Oak. Oak Bookshop tomorrow from 1 to 3. Is that 1 to 5. 1 to 5. Oh, yeah. all afternoon. you got plenty of time. I'll try to get the video up today. Wonderful. And uh, hopefully we'll see you there tomorrow. Great. Really appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having Thank me. Thank you so much, Jeff. Great to be back in all town. Right. Thank you.